We are now recording. Great, thanks, Jeff. Um, we can go ahead and get started. Um, want to welcome everyone this morning um, to our July 28th uh, meeting and um, start with a little bit of um, housekeeping. Um, I'm Nikki Lemon, uh, chair of the Health Department Advisory Panel, and um, want to make sure to remind folks to please mute your phones uh, throughout the call in order to eliminate um, background noise as much as possible. Um, if you are calling in, you should be able to press uh, star six to unmute if you need to speak during the call. You can also um, use the chat feature or the raise your hand feature uh, if you do have questions or comments. Um, but if you're unable to send questions um, through the chat, you can email uh, Jeff Montavon at jeffrey.montavon at epa.ohio.gov. Um, this meeting uh, is being recorded and it will also be available to watch um, after the meeting concludes. Uh, we do have an update to the agenda that was sent out earlier this week. Um, in place of the Enviro Tire presentation, we will have a financial assurance case study. So with that, um, Jeff, I will turn it over to you for a roll call. Thank you, Nikki. So um, just uh, members, when your name is called, just go ahead and say here and we will uh, mark you as presence. First, Mike Cooper. Hey, good morning from Peach Ridge this morning, guys. Hey, Mike, how's it going? Oh, not too Jeff bad, Ritchie. no rain. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Jeff Ritchie. Here. It's Jeff. Craig Ward. Here. Barry Grise. Yep, here, Jeff. But Paul said he will not be able to make it today, so Paul and Pascal will uh, so to attend. Rick Garrison. Not hearing Rick. Thanks. Chuck DeGonker. I know um it's mentioned Chuck won't be until maybe eleven. Larry Schaefer. Here. Joe Mazzola. Garrett Giozzi. Good morning, I'm here. Hey, Garrett. Richard Novickis. Richard and Beth Bickford. Hearing Beth. I'll text to Beth and see if she's joining. Thanks, appreciate it. All right, so we do have a quorum. Um, so Nikki, um, turn it back over to you. Great, thank you, Jeff. Um, and if anyone joins late, if you would like to um, just enter your name into the chat, let us know that you're here if you are a member of the panel and we can mark your attendance uh, accordingly. Um, just as a reminder, a little background on the um, advisory panel. Uh, the Health Department Advisory Panel was established uh, to create stronger relationships between the Ohio EPA Division of Materials and Waste Management and approved local health departments. Um, HDAP provides input to Ohio EPA DIMWIM, so the agency may assist local health departments in various aspects related to the solid and infectious waste and construction and demolition debris programs. Members of the panel participate voluntarily with two representatives participating from each of the Ohio EPA's district regions. Um, next on the agenda is approval of the April 28th meeting minutes. Um, Jeff, I will share my screen. I think those went out on Monday. Um, thank you, Jeff, for sending those out. Um, Well, I think I'm sharing the wrong thing. Okay. There we go. Uh, I would entertain a motion to approve the April 28th minutes, um, unless anyone has any changes. 
This is Garrett. Uh, I'll make that motion. I heard Garrett move um, to approve. Do we have a second? Second. Mike Cooper. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. So the April 28th, 2022 meeting minutes are approved. And let's see. Um, next on the agenda, we have uh, updates from the Ohio EPA. And uh, first up is Michelle Mountjoy for a rules update. Michelle? Hi. Uh, so it's been a few months since I've given been a rule update, obviously, but um, in real world, things move slow. So most of our statuses are the same. I will say we have, um, I think last time, uh, we might have touched on the scrap tire rules, and later in the agenda, we have Shannon Cohen, who's going to give a presentation on the scrap tire rules. So hold all of your uh, interesting questions for her, because she is the expert. And However, those rules should be finally uh, going out to interested party, hopefully next week. We did have the director approve that rules package to be released for interested party comment. So a reminder, you'll have 30 ish days to review the rules and provide us any comments. If you have comments, just email me. If you have questions, you can also email me and I will probably, full disclosure, send them to Shannon because, you know, I do want you to have the correct answers and, and she is our scrap tire guru. So look for those next week. If you want to be notified, remember we send all of our rule notifications via listserv. So if you are signed up for our listserv, you might want to go in and make sure your subscriptions are current that you are registered for the scrap tire list if you're interested. If not, uh, then then you should be good. If you need help subscribing to the listserv, definitely reach out to me because I can get that set up for you. We don't want you to not be notified and miss an opportunity to, to see the rules as early as possible. Fee rules, solid waste fee rules, those are also um, approaching their next milestone, which would be filing with JCAR. Those went out to interested party at the beginning of this year. So we did get some comments from a handful of solid waste management districts and some um, some other stakeholders. So we addressed most of those comments to the best we could, and we are ready to file those rules with JCAR probably in the next hmm, three to four weeks, two to three weeks range. Again, things move kind of slow in the rural world. So, and the most, other notable rule package that I think the health departments would care about that is starting to see some activity would be rule 2719. That's landfill operations rule. So we have been internally working on developing some conceptual changes that we'd like to see to the rule. And we are finalizing those concepts that we are going to in turn turn into rule changes. And that Next step would be an interested party draft for, for you all as well. Um, preview 2719, as, as you probably all know, it's in chapter 27. When you see it come out for interested party, it's going to look new. It's going to go into a reorganized chapter. It's going to be chapter 535. So that's 3745-535. If you've been keeping up with us, we have been moving a lot of our rules into the 500 series. So you saw licensing go from chapter 37 to 501. You've seen composting go from 27 to third to 560 uh, transfer facilities. This is another one. We're just going to be doing the operations rule right now because it's it's really cumbersome to bite off all of the landfill rules at once. But uh, in the same vein, the scrap tire rules, which now are in you know chapter 27, they're on like 27 50s through 60s. Those are also going to be in the 500 series when you see them. So all the text when you see these rules is going to look new because it, it's a new rule, but that doesn't mean everything is new. So we're, we're trying to develop crosswalks and different ways to show our interested parties what's changed and what hasn't changed and where things have gone. 
Um, obviously, if you need more assistance with that, please reach out and we'll try to make it as easy for you as possible to follow our line of thinking. So I'll stop there and answer any questions um, and move on. Great, thank you, Michelle. Lots uh, going on. So if uh, anyone does have any, have any questions or comments, um, you can put those in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and it doesn't look like anyone has any right now, um, but thank you, Michelle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and next we'll turn it over to Aaron Shear for an update on the CNDD rules. Thanks, Nikki. Um, good morning, everybody. I think I know many of you on the call today, um, so this may be a repeat uh, kind of performance here or refresher of what I've said before, but it's worth repeating. We've taken uh, huge strides in the last uh, year, year and a half when it comes to processing facilities and promulgating rules regarding construction demolition debris processing. So I want to give a, a brief overview of, of where we are today. Um, many of these rules went effective back in the spring and then another portion of the rules went effective here in early January. So I wanted to provide an update on those efforts and where we're moving forward with training opportunities, permitting, licensing requirements, and where we see the program moving forward. Um, I'm Aaron Shear. I supervise the Construction Demolition Debris Program here in Central Office for Dimwim. So I know I've worked with many health departments around the state with various landfills and, and other um, projects. I also wanted to thank our health district partners in these rule writing efforts. Um, there, many of you helped out during this effort the last couple of years. I really appreciate your feedback and your buy-in um, during these efforts. And I look forward to working with you guys in the future to actually implement the program. So with that said, you can go to the next slide here. So what are we talking about today? Well, historically, we, we really focused on construction and demolition to redisposal. And uh, so basically the landfills in the state where the uh, material would go for lawful disposal for basically um, into perpetuity, or we talked about a legal disposal of construction demolition debris um, in the unfortunate event that people were, were landfilling it in inappropriate places. But we really didn't have clear guidance and rules pertaining to the recycling and processing of this material. Uh, we want to promote um, landfill diversion. We want to promote re uh, responsible recycling, and there, there's many outfits in the state that do that already. However, there are some operations out there that kind of use that as a as a guise for uh, a, a illegal disposal of the material. So, in response to that poorly managed operations, um, I think most people were familiar with a couple of facilities up in Northeast Ohio that led to very large cleanups at the state and county expense level. Uh, we've, we finally got some direction to promulgate rules several years ago with Senate Bill 2. So uh, next slide, please. So we started developing rules for construction demolition debris processing. So what exactly is CDD processing? Well, it's uh, handling construction demolition debris uh, with the intent of separating it out into individual types of material that they could be used as a commodity and can be used to recycle or turn that material back into some type of product or use it in some type of beneficial manner. Um, handling and processing is a pretty broad term. So any type of receipt of the material, temporary storage of the material for, for a short duration of time, moving the material from say trucks or dumpsters onto a working surface to separate it out into various types of materials for recycling purposes or for, for beneficial use. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what is a CND processing facility then? Well, that's a location, uh, building, site, tract of land, that is used to uh, process, transfer, recycle that material that's generated off of the pro uh, premises of the facility. So we're not talking about the actual point of generation here. So if you're knocking down a large structure, say a, a school building, a commercial building, industrial building, um, and then maybe doing some separating of metal, separating of, of clean hard fill, maybe other recyclable materials at the point of origin, those really aren't going to be subject to our processing facility program 
Um, those are usually temporary in nature, several days, weeks, maybe even a month or two to do that demolition project. But that's really not long term processing. Uh, we're looking at other facilities where the material is going. Being recycled, being separated and more of a, a long term plan for those types of facilities. Uh, what also is not included in, in a processing facility are licensed uh, solid waste transfer facilities, land, licensed uh, solid waste landfills, or a licensed CND landfill where that processing of the mixed material, so the inbound mixed CND, uh, occurs entirely within the unloading zone. So you have a CND landfill, you have a designated unloading zone. There's no now four markers for that unloading zone. If you're if you're processing in that unloading zone, maybe pulling out scrap metal to recycle or pulling out some other material that you can recycle, reuse. Um, if you're doing that in that in that working zone or unloading zone, you won't be subject to these rules. We'll see here in a little bit though. If you're if you're moving that to a different working surface, you're moving it off of the unloading zone to another place at your landfill, then you would be subject to some of these rules. And we'll kind of discuss that distinction here in a couple of slides. Uh, next slide, please. There's uh, two other exclusions, you know, so I went over the whole MSW landfills, transfer facilities, unloading zone of a CND landfill. There's two other exclusions that we worked out. Uh, one of which is uh, if you basically solely have the material aggregate volume of less than 50 cubic yards, you keep it in um, your dumpsters or your truck, your vehicle. Um, and you're never placing it on a working surface or into any kind of equipment, conveyor belts, separating equipment, anything else, uh, you wouldn't be subject to the, this rule package. Um, kind of examples here are the small kind of renovation demo companies. Maybe they're doing kitchen renovations, bathroom renovations, throwing it all in their, their uh, pickup truck or in a small dumpster, taking it back to their shop, and maybe they're filling in a 40 yard dumpster at their shop. They're never putting it on the ground. That dumpster never gets an aggregate volume of 50 cubic yards. Once that dumpster is full, they take it to a CND landfill for disposal. There are um, hundreds of those kind of small demo companies, renovation companies in the state. They would not be subject to these types of, of regulations. The second of which you can uh, move on. There's also kind of a carve out for some other dumpster companies, container companies. So if you're transporting portable containers containing construction demolition debris and you're storing them in those containers, that the materials never leaving those containers, never hitting a working surface and you're storing them for no more than seven days, uh, you're also not subject to these this this program. So this kind of scenario is maybe you have a dumpster business where you kind of do your milk runs, your, your dumpster runs. Monday through Thursday or Monday through Friday, all the dumpsters come back to your, you know, warehouse or your, your yard and get stored. And then on Friday and Saturdays, when you run it all to the landfill, that kind of storage of those dumpsters for that short duration of time would not be subject to these um, uh, rules either. Next slide. Uh, so kind of as I alluded to earlier, um, there's actually two types of, of processing facilities. Uh, once we had some discussions with external stakeholders, um, health departments, as well as industry uh, sector, it made sense to kind of split the rules into, into two sets of rule packages. Um, the standalone processing facilities, which we'll talk about here um, on this slide, and then co-located processing facilities, which are those that are on the same footprint as a CMB landfill. So a standalone processing facility is, is not located within a CMD landfill, hence the name standalone. Uh, that rule package and those rules became effective back in April of this year. And in a few more slides, I'll talk about the permitting and licensing requirements for the standalone types of facilities. Um, really, we, we created a whole new uh, set of rules, uh, 450 through 460 pertain to the standalone rules. Um, so there'll be a, a rule that talks about permitting requirements, talks about the uh, design plan, what needs to go into uh, different types of figures and plan drawings and detailed drawings to kind of lay out how the um, standalone facility looks, where they're storing material, where they're actually doing their, their processing on a working surface. It goes into additional information about operational requirements for standalone facilities, financial assurance obligations, certified operator, 
um, and final post closure care of construction demolition debris um, processing facilities. So that's all found in 450 through 460. Next slide, please. There you go. Did it go? Oh yeah, there it goes. Um, so so co-located processing facilities, um, as the, the name implies, those are the facilities that are already located on the footprint of a C&D landfill. So we have many C&D landfills uh, in the state that want to divert some waste streams from the actual unloading zone, the working face of the facility. We, we want to, you know, um, promote, you know, minimizing that airspace and, and only sitting material there that needs to be disposed of. There are many types of demolition debris that can be recycled, reused, um, turned into clean, hard fill, uh, or used in other purposes. So in, in those kind of situations, it's already happening pretty much on the landfill footprint. Um, there already are some engineering controls in place. There's already some design plans. There's already some operational requirements for our landfills. So we took those landfill rules, uh, 401 through 426, and kind of inserted the concept of processing uh, within those landfill rules. So it's kind of an add-on where a landfill owner can say, hey, above and beyond just disposing of this material, I may want to redirect it to a separate portion of my landfill space where I can do that processing. I can do that separating of the material um, and then reuse, recycle, and, and use those materials. Maybe there's some, some uh, waste streams at the end of the line that has no reuse value, no recycling. Those materials end up in the unloading zone ultimately, but prior to doing that, they kind of have this, you know, carve out. So that package went effective here at the beginning of the month, July 4th, um, and really we're wrapping those facilities into the normal licensing process for CD landfills. So there might be some additions to the application, which we'll talk about here in a few slides, but it's really not going to be that much of a change or a difference from what we're already seeing with our, our C&D landfill program. Next slide. So um, there are permitting and licensing requirements for the standalone facilities. Um, so this is kind of a whole new uh, program when it comes to the standalone, these, these third party operations. Um, so there is a PTI that's every five years. And then there will be this annual license that occurs, um, well, has the name, uh, infers annually once a year, they'll, they'll renew their license. Um, the permitting and licensing authority in many instances will be the approved health departments. We'll talk about that here in a slide or two. Um, but that's kind of the new program where we'll be looking at the permitting and licensing for these standalone facilities. As far as these co-located ones, the ones that are on the footprint of C and DD landfills, that'll be an annual license. Uh, and it'll be one application for both of the facility, which is the landfill and the processing facility, which is co-located on that footprint. And so there'll be that annual licensing um, that occurs for both those types of facilities. Next slide, please. So where to find these applications and forms? We created a new construction and demolition debris processing facility webpage. And on that webpage, we'll have various recordings from, from past webinars, future webinars. There's guidance documents on, on the webpage, as well as there'll be various forms, daily logs of operation, uh, other record keeping forms. Um, through there, you can kind of navigate through the web page and there will be the uh, for the standalone facilities. There already is the permit application and the um, license application on there. Uh, right now, our online eBiz system is not set up for the standalone facilities yet. We're working with our IT folks for future years. So for the standalone process, we're, we're kind of going back um, and doing some historical kind of more paper forms. There's still going to be some electronic submittal options uh, through through like a, a drop site, but mainly those forms will not be done through the, the eBiz platform that we do for many of our other programs. As far as the co-located facilities, we are going to be hopefully using eBiz and the licensing module, so stay tuned to hear more on that. Go ahead. Um, so kind of as I just said, the uh, processing facility PTI license applications for those standalone forms 
uh, will be mailed in or submitted electronically this year. Once again, there's there's submission instructions on our web page to go through that process. Uh, I think in a future slide here, we'll show we did a webinar already kind of talking about permitting and licensing for these standalone facilities. We'll be doing a refresher to that coming up in uh, end of September, early October. Uh, we may be trying tying that into some additional conferences. I know there's some OEHA conferences coming up um, in September and October, and so I'm hoping to partner with with the various districts on maybe presenting um, on those platforms. And then I know um, Ohio EPA has a compliance assistance conference that is coming up in September as well. So you'll be hearing from me a lot. Um, obviously, since this is a new program. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions. Um, you know, I, I can tell you already, it's, it's it's a growing process. We're all learning along the way. So uh, you know, if, if anybody in the health departments have questions, concerns about the process, free, please feel free to reach out to me or my team, and we'll have our contact information at the end of this slideshow. Um, we're trying to streamline this as as easy as possible and make this uh, kind of transition. Uh, work as smoothly, but we do understand there may be some hiccups along the way. This is the first time we've gone through this program. I know years ago with the composting program, you know, we had similar kind of, we had some growing pains, we had some things along the way. So we're trying to you know, learn some lessons on how to roll this out efficiently and effectively to everybody. Next slide, please. Um, as I spoke with earlier, the uh, approved boards of health in many instances are both the permitting and a licensing authority for these standalone facilities. Um, as I said, the, the permits only five years. So every five years, there'll be a, a permit renewal as well as the annual licensing. Um, there is a carve out in statute where um, if the health department may not have the internal resources, maybe not the engineering or some of the other resources in house, uh, Ohio EPA can step up and provide some of that compliance assistance, technical support, as well as help with that permitting process. So don't feel like you're doing it alone. Don't, you know, like I said, this is kind of a learning process for all of us. We're here to provide that support, that assistance, um, both through our health department, both through our district offices, our district office engineers and inspectors, as well as our central office support uh, here in Columbus. So. Um, if anybody has questions about permitting and licensing, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, next uh, slide. So the, the big date that's coming up here is October 18th. So as I said before, these rules went into effect back in April. The facilities had um, six months to get their initial PTI and their initial license application in. So we've already had a couple webinars regarding that uh, online. We'll have some more in the future, but really that's the big date for this kind of first load of applications to come in. Um, right now, the kind of the mindset is I think there's maybe 40 to 50 standalone facilities in the state that we're aware of. Um, there very well could be more throughout the state it, um, with the pandemic and, and having some limited options of getting out in the field, doing some door to door campaigns. It's hard to really know that whole universe. But at a minimum, I'm expecting maybe 40 to 50 processing facilities across the state that will be submitting these initial permits and licenses in. Um, like I said, we'll have some responsibility for unapproved health departments, while some of them will be going into the approved health departments. But we're all a team here, so hopefully we'll be we're working towards that October 18th deadline uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, next slide. When it comes to the PTI application. There is a uh, $1,000 application fee, uh, and then there's a $2,000 issuance fee. So when this initial PTI comes in, there will hopefully be a $1,000 check with that application. And then once the PTI is issued, they have 30 months, the owner operator of the processing facility, to remit that additional $2,000. Um, why $3,000? Um, well, some of that was, was carved out in statute. The other, op the other um, thing we had to consider here is there's no tipping fees associated with this program. So usually the health department and EPA administer our programs through disposal fees, tipping fees at landfills, C&D landfills, MSW landfills. Um, it's not the case here. You know that these aren't disposal facilities. Um, these standalone facilities, there's no disposal taking place. So really this $3,000 every five years is to assist in implementing the program. 
Uh, as part of the PTI application, there is this design plan. The design plan will lay out the boundaries, the footprint of, of processing. It'll lay out the working surface. It'll, it'll lay out where mixed C and DD will be stored. Also, the design plan, there's calculations on maximum volumes of how much mixed C and DD will be on site, which is important to tie into financial assurance. There is financial assurance um, uh, uh, obligations tied into how much stored material you have on site. There's also financial assurance obligations for how big of a footprint you have. So how big is your processing facility? How big is your footprint? Um, and so that also there's some calculations in the design plan. Another big portion of the PTI is this fire prevention and response plan. So basically we want to know how are you going to prevent fires? You know, let's make sure everybody's aware of, you know, where fire hydrants are, what kind of, you know, maybe on-site soils there are, other on-site resources in the event of a fire. Has the fire department been notified of a response to a fire on the site? And are they willing to, you know, respond in, in the event, uh, hopefully if there's no fires, but in the event that there is some type of, of fire event at the site. Next uh, slide, please. So I talked about five years for the PTI. As far as the license application goes, there is a $100 application fee and then a $650 issuance fee. So on an annual basis, when those applications are coming in annually every September, um, it'll be $100 and then 30 days after issuance, which usually is around the first of the year for the new calendar year, there's that $650 issuance fee. Um, in the PTI, the facility had to tell us how much mixed materials on site, how big their footprint is. Now for their license, they have to fund that financial assurance. One thing that we carried over from our landfill program is the certified operator requirement. So there's the obligation that every facility has a certified operator that has a minimum experience of one year of, of operating a facility, as well as uh, 10 hours of continuing education credits. Um, so annually, they have to have two hours of rules and laws, followed by six hours of best management practices, and then two hours of, of some other types of training, be it rules and laws or best management practices, 10 hours, 10 hours a year. Next slide. Um, so for co-located, as I said, the standalone had the October 18th deadline to get their initial in. Uh, the co-located facilities, since those rule efforts went effective here July 4th, uh, they have 180 days to get their initial license in. So that's December 31st. Um, what we're really trying to encourage the industry to do is since their landfill license is due at the end of September, and this is a small add-on to that license to, to show and designate where you're processing on that landfill footprint. Hopefully many of the landfills that are processing get, get them both in at the same time in end of September, but the rule does allow to this December 31st date. Um, so we are working through kind of behind the scenes how that's going to play out, how maybe we can add an addendum to the license or add kind of maybe an amended license somehow where if they want to bring in this processing facility concept in October, November, December of this year. So already their license application for 2023, they can do that kind of concurrently. So we're working on that process right now. Jeff, go ahead. Um, for, for licenses, they're, they're, uh, for co-located, there's no permits. Uh, it's just a license similar to a landfill license. There's that $100 application fee and a $650 uh, issuance fee. Similar to the other programs, there will be that certified operator requirement. Um, since this is just adding on to the existing tabs and the license for the landfill, there's only a few tabs that really need to be amended or added to. Uh, the design plan's already covered in tab four and five of the um, c and landfill license. So they'll just have to add, show those elements on their design plan, their detailed drawings of where that footprint is of, of processing. Similarly, uh, tab 12 already covers the face tool, the financial assurance cost estimate tool. And um, so we're just adding on to the um, financial assurance cost estimate in tab 12. 
to add the financial assurance for having stored mixed CNDD either within your active license disposal area of your landfill or the inactive disposal area of the landfill. And lastly, we're adding this new tab for fire prevention and adding on that fire prevention plan at the end of their license. Go ahead, Jeff. So as I said before, we had a, we already had one webinar talking about permitting and licensing requirements uh, for standalone facilities. We'll be doing a refresher of, of that one here uh, back in the fall, uh, probably end of uh, September, maybe early October. We have a new upcoming licensing requirements webinar uh, here August 11th. Hopefully folks saw there's some listserv messages that went out. Um, there's also a link on our web page and a banner on our web page right now regarding this August 11th licensing webinar. Uh, future webinars, we're looking at doing operational requirements. We, you know, right now we're really focusing on permitting and licensing, getting these initial applications in with this October deadline and December deadline. But the next step would be, well, what kind of operational requirements? You know, when it comes to the daily log of operations, uh, storing material, having a, a working surface that's manageable, um, those types of obligations from an operational standpoint. Um, we're looking at doing webinars in the fall, so probably October, November timeframe to talk about, hey, once these facilities are permitted and licensed, what are they obligated to do from an operational standpoint? Uh, next slide, please. So here's my contact information as well as my team. Uh, like I said, we've all been working diligently on these rule efforts and moving forward with actually implementing the rule. So feel free to reach out to any of us or all of us if you have questions. Um, like I said, we're, we're a team here uh, where we're looking forward to helping everybody out, providing that technical support, compliance assistance. Um, you'll be hearing many of our names moving forward when it comes to developing guidance documents, fact sheets, many of which are on our web page right now, but feel free to reach out to any of us um, at, at any point in time. Uh, next next slide. So I, I think that's it. Like I said, this was really a 10,000 foot view. We, we plan on doing additional webinars, speaking opportunities at hopefully maybe OEHA conferences, our own OCAP conference, doing some additional operational webinars in the fall. But at this point, does anybody have any general questions, any comments, anything you want to go over today uh, in this uh, meeting? I didn't see, did we get anything in the chat or anything I should probably know about? Yeah, Aaron, this is Nikki. Um, thank you for all of that um, really great information and, and the way that it was presented. Um, and your offer uh, to speak at, at some of the upcoming um, OEHA district conferences. Um, I put in the chat, absolutely Southeast, we would love to have you um, speak. We just had a meeting, planning meeting this morning uh, before this one, and uh, yes. we're, we're trying to get speakers lined up. So the, the timing is really great. Um, we do have a, a question if the um, slide deck would be included. Um, as as part of the follow up for this meeting, if if um, folks could get a copy of that, um, it's really great information laid out really well. So yeah, not a problem. I, Jeff already has the PowerPoint. I know there's links, the hyperlinks in the PowerPoint to take you to our web page and the, the forms. So yeah, he can definitely send that out as part of meeting notes or whatever follow up that you guys usually do for these meetings. So yeah, thanks, Nikki. All right, wonderful. Uh, does anyone um, have any questions or comments for Aaron? Before we move on, we did put a registration link for the August 11th co located processing facility webinar. So you can just click on that. That'll take you to the registration page. Just complete it and um, you'll get the link as soon as you register. And similar to the prior webinar, it will be recorded and up on our webpage, the YouTube channel, very soon thereafter. So if you can't attend the August 11th, there'll be other opportunities to to watch it on your own leisure when you get a chance. Great, thank you. Um, and then Jeff, if you could make a note that um, Chuck Dionker did join us uh, a few minutes ago. Will do. Okay, well then Jeff, you're next up on the agenda, so I will turn it over to you. Th thank you, Aaron, for your um, presentation. 
Thank you, Nikki. I think we also have Debbie Nicely and Rachel Ballard on too. So uh, we're just going to kind of talk about, you know, last meeting, Joe Gomekche had talked about the health department learning plans that Dimlin was rolling out. So um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on that. So those, a couple of those are available. It's going to be an ongoing process. So as the division continues to develop training opportunities for health departments. They're putting being put into a training plan for health departments so that they can anyone can just kind of sign up for those. So um, they're going to be done through Ohio Learns. I'm going to share my screen quickly here and just kind of show you the process. Um, if you happen to get a mosquito control grant with Ohio EPA, this is going to be similar to the uh, training that we require people to complete what my um here so um what you would need you have to have an ohid account so um you just go to ohid.ohio.gov this will give you that we also have a fact sheet we'll be sending out next week for everybody too with instructions so if you don't have an account you just create one the create ohid account if you currently have one you just enter your information into there type the right password. So once you are into OHID, um, you would need to subscribe to Ohio Learn. I already have, so it's already here. But you can find that in the App Store. Then here you would just type in Ohio Learn, search for it, the magnifying glass, and you'll scroll down where you'll find Ohio Learn. So we'll open the app. This looks like a really easy process now, but we'll have step by step instructions for this too. So once this comes on, you'll have an option for Ohio EPA. You would click that. This would allow the training to be assigned to you. And then I've already had this assigned to me. So you have your learning plans. So you would be able to find those past trainings that we've offered. So these have been developed. You click on that. Um, there are knowledge checks throughout there. So um, it's, it's a pretty sophisticated way to go through them. Uh, I know some of these probably were on the YouTube channel, but this is a good way to track your history and how you completed those courses in the past. So this might be something that some health departments want to include as part of their learning plans for their staff. But, um, should be a good opportunity for learning. So um, if you're interested in those, we will have a form you can just fill out and put your name and email address in there, or you can just email me directly. We'll send that to um, Debbie and uh, Rachel in our um, training group, and they'll get those assigned to you. And if you do have any issues accessing Ohio Learn or OHID, um, Debbie and Rachel can help you out there as well, just kind of to make sure there aren't any issues. And we did our mosquito control grant. A few people had some problems accessing that. I think Rachel was able to straighten it out pretty quickly with some, uh, some tech support there. Um, so, We'll continue to add training modules to that, and that uh, should be a good opportunity for any uh, health departments who want to take part in that. Uh, we've got Rachel, Debbie, do you have anything to add to that? Or does that sound pretty cut and dry to you? I think what you shared sounded perfect. Thank you, Jeff. And Chet, Joe, any comments in addition to that? Give a thumbs up from Joe. So yeah, so we'll be rolling out next week. We'll get a, an email message out to approved health departments. So if you're interested in accessing those trainings, they will be available for you. Wonderful. Um, okay, next on the agenda is um, Ohio Environmental Health Association update with Garrett Giozzi. Morning, everyone. Uh, just here to give an update for OEHA. I wanted to highlight our upcoming fall conferences. Uh, the Northeast Conference is going to be October 11th and 12th. Uh, that's going to be in Twinsburg this year. 
Uh, Northwest is October 13th and 14th. That'll be located at Kalahari again. Southwest is October 5th and 6th, and that's going to be at Sinclair. And I am waiting on the finalized dates for Southeast. So um, I can get those out to the group with an email when we have updated registration information for that as well. Um, as far as that, that's really it. I would just encourage you all to check out the website. It's ohioeha.org. We have several items up there that are new, uh, especially some additional continuing education opportunities for those in environmental health. So I would just encourage you to check that out. I'm happy to take any questions and I know Beth is on the call. She's on the phone, so she'll have to be muted. But if there are any legislative questions too, I believe she's going to give an update. I'd be happy to chime in and uh, provide any additional information. Thanks, Garrett. Yeah, um, I'm going to try to unmute. Or maybe Jeff, if you can unmute Beth. Um, yeah, I don't know that I, I can. So you got seeing where she is here. It's not the option right now. Let me just straighten down here. Star. Yeah, nine, Beth, can you hear star six? six and see if that'll work? Okay. There you are. Okay. Can so you hear me? Now? Okay. Hi, everybody. I was actually been on the phone since you called my name in roll call. But when I logged in, it said it automatically muted me. So I didn't know how to unmute myself from this end. I apologize. Anyways, Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm disrupting your agenda just a bit. But I also had a question about the C and D rules, and I couldn't. Um, you couldn't hear me then. So um, I wondered, you know, would that presentation be available, perhaps, to our public affairs committee? at a future meeting um, because I think our group would appreciate hearing that information. Yeah, certainly. Uh, and if we need to tailor it with specific questions or specific insight or things that they may particularly want to know, we can always see that. Yeah. Um, updated yeah, I think or reflect those things. An overview, an overview okay. would be awesome. You might even have to get into all the technical difficulties about yeah permit to install and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, these a lot of these rules have been a long time coming, so it would refresh all of our memories to remember what rules we're supposed to be doing. So yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, anyway, on to my report. OK, um, the um, fall conference for the AOHC um, provides every year is coming up September 14th to 16th. And we have a wide variety of topics, and um, actually, EPA is going to be providing this one of our breakout sessions. So we thank you for that. I also want to uh, remind everyone, and I may have done that at the April meeting, although we didn't have our calendar fully um, completed yet. But on the education page of our website, which is which is AOHC.net are all the upcoming um, events that we're having through spring of next year that are um, maybe appropriate for if you have brand new staff. For example, we have an August um, uh, event of um, new employee training, we call it. It's you know kind of a public health 101, what does it mean to work in governmental local public health in Ohio? And then we also have some um, leadership courses that are um, designed for program staff and others who have any kind of management responsibilities. So, and a, actually a new finance class, which I don't know how much the staff that you all work with would, would be interested in that. But I just wanted to let you know, um, there's kind of a lot on that page. So it's difficult to list here over the phone and, you know, my memory's not that good. So. <laughs> I um, encourage you to go to AOHC.net and click on the education button right at the top and you can see everything that's coming up that you you or your staff might be interested in. So with that, I will um, stop talking about those things. And the nice thing is we are getting some support from the 
state's portion of the workforce development grant that came from the CDC. So the um, the cost of these classes is, is negligible. If we have to, if we're providing lunch or something, then we have to, you know, collect money for food since um, grants don't pay for food. But other than that, the grant is covering a lot of the expenses, including if it's a two-day class, the overnight stay at a hotel, um, all the materials, et cetera. Uh, so I, you know, suggest you look at that if it if it, you think there might be something there that you or your staff might might be able to benefit from. Um, glad to answer any questions on that. Moving quickly to legislation, I think uh, the one item that was mentioned to me by Jeff and Chet when they asked me to add this to my report is House Bill 463, which has a, also has a Senate companion bill that hasn't, I don't even think, been assigned to a committee yet in the Senate. So, um, and that's um, Senate Bill 324, and it's the bill that um, sets forth a different way of of appointing Board of Health members and approving Board of Health and Health Department budgets. And so we are in the summer recess of the legislature right now, but what we're doing is uh, some targeted, specific educational um, intervention, if you will, with key legislators in the House so that when they decide if they're going to move this bill, they actually know what's in it. And um, it's in the same committee that Senate Bill 22 was in. So we all know how that went in terms of folks just voting for stuff because somebody told them to. Um, and so we're, we are embarking upon a significant targeted educational effort this summer while everyone's back in their districts. We don't expect the legislature back for any kind of action till after the November election, but we all know what happens then with Thanksgiving and Christmas, it's just wild and crazy time. And it's also at the end of a biennium and the government governor's term. So it will be a free for all. So as much as we can do in advance of that to educate legislators on what authority already exists for transparency and accountability, um, especially stressing how much or actually how little county commissioners contribute to the funding of a local health department. Um, those are all key pieces of our education in, in this regard. So that's really our primary focus. I know there was another um, bill that was contemplating um, extending the ability for virtual meetings, but that kind of died at the end of the session. Nothing happened on that. And so that ability expired at the end of June to have uh, virtual meetings of your Board of Health or any other meetings of subcommittees or whatever at your, you know, if you have a district licensing council, for example, that any one of those that falls under the public meetings requirement, um, you're back into uh, require uh, uh, needing to have um, in-person meetings. So those are the two main things we were monitoring most closely at the end of the session that ended mid mid June or whenever it finally ended. Thank the Lord. Um, <laughs> and so, and other than that, as you know, the Supreme Court once again um, did not approve the redistricting map for Congress at the federal level. So they've been given 30 days to come up with yet another one. I think this is their fourth or fifth try at that. Um, and so that impacts, you know, lots of things, you know, in terms of the delayed primary and the general election and all kinds of fun stuff. So we're waiting to see how that plays out. That was just announced last week. And so we're, we're still learning more about what that does in terms of impacting um, the election and any local health departments that, for example, you know, may or may not be contemplating putting a levy on the ballot. Um, you know, there may be more opportunities if they have to keep adding election days because of this delay. So with that, I'll stop and try to answer any questions y'all might have. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to um, either raise your hand or drop them in the chat. 
Oh, you're doing that, Nikki. I just wanted to let you all know, I, I don't know why I have such trouble with the state team's line, and I always end up having to just dial in by phone. So I apologize if I'm not able to see hands and contribute via chat and those kinds of things. I don't know what my problem is, but it just seems to be that line that I have difficulty with. And no worries, Beth. Um, if there are any questions that pop up, we will uh, be sure to let you know. Um, but thank you um, for sharing that information. And um, we will move on to um, the nominating committee uh, recommendation. And I will turn it over to uh, Craig Ward from Erie. OK, can you hear me OK, Nikki? OK, so I'll keep this fairly brief um, just to give you just a slight bit of background of everything going on. I think most of the panelists know we do have um, a member who is going to be leaving the committee. So we were tasked with coming up with a way to fill those vacancies. Uh, just to give you a background of how we did that, um, Jeff from um, Ohio EPA actually solicited um, nominations or people to nominate somebody from the Southeast District because that's where our vacancy is occurring, send an email out and a I'm wrong on this. I think it was the very end of May. We tried to keep nominations open through, I think it was July 8th, um, just so that way it gave us some time to review the nomination, send them to other committee members to look at, because again, we're looking for obviously an approved health district, someone who maybe has some experience in solid waste, obviously fill this vacancy. Um, so we actually did uh, receive one nomination. Um, we did send this off to uh, fellow committee members, Larry Schaefer and Barry Grise. We all reviewed it. Um, we do have a recommendation today, but I guess before I give that recommendation, I'm not quite clear on our parliamentary procedures and how the committee works. I don't know if we still need to leave this open and see if there's any nominations on the call today before we make our nomination. Um, Jeff, maybe you can help me with that clarification. Yeah, so if we have any nominations from the um, from the group today, we'll take those. I'm not hearing any, so we would need a motion to close nominations. And this is Craig Ward. I'll motion to close nominations. This is Garrett. I'll second. Second, it. Larry. All right. Okay. I heard a, a motion from. I heard a motion from uh, Craig, right, and then a second from Garrett. Larry. Thank you. Okay. Just, um, just one of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, a motion from Craig and a, a second from Larry. So nominations. All see all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none opposed, we will close nominations and now um, we take a motion to accept. Uh, Craig, you want to make, if you want to move for your. Um, yeah, so basically, you know, with the recommendation of the committee, we'd like to nominate Carrie Bowers um, from Perry County for the vacancy. And we need a second to uh, accept that this nomination. Is, this is Larry, I second the motion. Second by Larry. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Then we accept the nomination. So Carrie Bowers will fill the vacancy from um, Southeast District Office and will be on the Health Department Advisory Panel. I know we have Kerry on the call today too. I asked him to say a couple of words and um, maybe give a little background about Perry County Health Department. So Kerry, floor is yours. Sure, thank you. Um, hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, I definitely appreciate the opportunity to be on the, the panel. Um, I've been here at Perry County since 2011 and I started out in the solid waste program. Um, I am now the director I've been more uh, trained. We're training new employees. So I've been more in the food program here the last couple months, um, but I plan to maintain and continue to work in the solid waste program and work with the Ohio EPA 
Um, we've had a great relationship and great working experiences over the last 12 years. Um, so I look forward to having some input and, and, and appreciate being on the panel. And uh, if anybody has any questions of me, please feel free to ask. And thank you. Thank you, Carrie, and welcome to the panel. It's nice to have you on board. Thank you. So with that, um, thank you also to the nominating committee. Um, and um, just as a reminder, if we do have any other future um, vacancies um, to please uh, have conversations with your colleagues, um, put those uh, nominations forward. Um, we would uh, we would appreciate it. Uh, let's see. So next is a scrap tire rules update. And I'm going to turn it over to Shannon Cohen uh, with the scrap tire unit. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to briefly show my face because I always have horrible connections, but I just want people to put a face with a voice and enthusiasm, excitement. So good morning, beautiful people. I'm going to provide a, a quick um, overview of the draft changes to the scrap tire rules. And as Michelle mentioned, we're hoping to go out interested party next week. And I am so pumped. I hope you are pumped too. I mean, you're going to review the rules and give us great feedback. We, we definitely want criticism. If that's going to make the rule package better, at the end of the day, we want the most amazing rule package ever. So I'm going to stop sharing my face and um, start going through this presentation. Now, Jeff, am I actually doing the presentation or are you going to do it for me? If you want me to share, Shannon, I can do that, but you're welcome to share from yours and advance the slides, whatever you're more comfortable with. You know, I'll let you advance because I could really mess this up, get disconnected, and um, just please let me know if I start breaking up, because again, I have a horrible connection, typically. Pull up your PowerPoint here. Okay, so just let me know when you need to advance the slide. Okay, I am ready for you to advance. So the topics I'm gonna cover include what is the Scrap Tower Management Universe? Um, external outreach performed regarding updates to the Scrap Tower rules. The goals that were set when we started working on the Scrap Tower rule package. Uh, changes to the rule layout. And then I want to go over some substantive changes made to the Scrap Tower rules. Next slide. So the scrap tire rules were designed to regulate the scrap tire from cradle to grave. And, you know, as a result, there are several parts to the scrap tire management infrastructure or universe. And I universe and I like to just kind of go over that with people because it covers a lot of infrastructure. Next slide. So the biggest part of the scrap tire management infrastructure are the actual businesses that generate scrap tires. And so based on standard industrial classification, there are between 5,000 to 8,000 scrap tire generating businesses in Ohio. We're talking about new and used tire shops, um, car repair shops, dealerships, motor vehicle salvage jars, and the list just goes on and on and on. So it is a huge part of this universe. We also have approximately 100 registered scrap tire transporters. And then when we start talking about the storage of tires, we have two types of facilities. We have the scrap tire collection facility, which is the smallest. And we have six of those licensed facilities in Ohio. And then we have storage facilities. And there are two classifications, the class one and the class two. And the class one is the largest. Presently, we do not have any scrap tire storage facilities licensed in Ohio. And then when we talk about the actual manipulation of the tire or turning it into a product, we regulate those under scrap tire recovery facilities. And there are two classifications there. 
the class one and the class two also, the class one being the larger. Presently, we have 11 licensed scrap tire recovery facilities. I have, the, I have the wrong number here on the slide. Two of those are class ones and they are operated by Liberty. And then the other nine are class twos. We also have two types of monocells that we, that we regulate. And I'll touch on that a little bit later in the presentation. Personally, we do not have any licensed scrap tire monocells. And then we also have the scrap tire monofill landfill. And presently, we have one of those in Ohio. Next slide, please. We also regulate the beneficial use of scrap tires. So presently in rule, we have pre-authorized, 12, sorry, pre-authorized beneficial uses for scrap tires. And then when someone wants to beneficially use a tire and it is not pre-authorized in rule, they have to seek approval from our director. And since so since early 2000, we have authorized 30 uh, beneficial use project plans through our director. And the last part of the scrap tire management universe, of course, are the scrap tire remediation sites. Since the inception of the program, we have cleaned up over 1,100 scrap tire remediation sites. These sites are made up of legacy piles, uh, new piles found on public and private lands. And then also it includes just the day-to-day -day pickup by public servants off of roadways and um, public lands. And typically what they do is they take those tires and store them at, say, a municipal garage or on public land. And then Ohio EPA, through our no-fault program, will go and uh, pick up those tires and have those tires typically repurposed. Next slide. So we've been working on this rule package since 2017, and we have performed an, a lot of external outreach to get this rule package to where it is. So I just want to highlight some of that external outreach. Um, updates to the scrap tire rules started in March of 2017. However, even before early stakeholder outreach was performed, Meaning, meaningful discussions were being had to change it, to discuss changes that needed to happen to the scrap tire rules. So the first two I want to highlight is the 2016 scrap tire summit and the 2018 scrap tire reform. And both of these cases, partners were invited to discuss the ongoing problem of open dumping tire abandonment in Ohio. And I'm, I'm sure that some people on the line were were invited or were at the summit and, and hopefully the forum. Um, we invited solid waste management districts, of course, our health department partners and, and local law enforcement. And then of course, there was a significant amount of participation from um, private stakeholders. From those two meetings, many recommendations were proposed to kind of address the open dumping tire abandonment issue. And many of those recommendations uh, were incorporated into the rule package. We also put out two industry surveys. Now here's this industry service, but actually that's a mistake, is two partner surveys. We actually reached out to our partners like health departments, solid waste management districts, and local law enforcement, and asked them for their feedback on uh, portions of the rule that, that we thought we probably needed to update. Also based on a recommendation that came out of the 2016 Scrap Tire Summit, we decided to survey scrap tire generating businesses. And in that process, we, we obtained very meaningful information that helped us also make some updates to the scrap tire rule package. Next slide, please. Because of some of the proposed changes to the rules, we actually uh, performed in-person visits to all of the scrap tire recovery facilities that we had in the early part of this year, which was at that time 10, um, kind of in conjunction with, a, with financial assurance purposes. And what we did is kind of went over the substantive changes that were being proposed at that time in the rule package and asked them to please review the rules when they go out interested party and provide meaningful feedback. Some other meetings I just want to mention is, of course, we had our draft rules question and answer session, which is typically held when you have ES an ESCO. And then we also have four webinars on conceptual rule changes. I'm sure some of you were, were part of those conceptual those conceptual webinars, and we really appreciate the feedback that we received um, during those from those webinars. We also had one webinar solely for 
again, the recovery facility because we wanted them to be aware of some of the substantive changes that we were proposing and really value their feedback and um, just wanted just kind of wanted to keep them in the loop. Next slide, please. So I just want to touch on the goals. Next slide. So in the process of updating this rule package, the goals were to make the scrap terror rules easier to read, simplify some of the requirements where possible, and then to update the format. And so here on the slide, I just, I'm just mentioning some of the things that we really focused on. So we grouped rules for each facility type for ease of reading, and that I'll touch on that in a second. We simplified, simplified long-winded mosquito control requirements um, that we had in rule. I'll, I'll give you a quick example of that. So presently in 56, we have uh, a transporter kind of do one thing when they pre-position trailers at a, a, a scrap tire generating business, depending on if it's an if it's an active site and whether they give them an enclosed trailer or an open top trailer, then we have to do have them do another set of mosquito control. If it is an open top container, you know, we have them go out and pull the tires every seven days, or they have to maintain records showing that. They um, that they did that and all these th all these things that you know really are just long winded con uh, mosquito control requirements and so we've essentially essentially simplified that to say hey keep the tires dry and apply pesticide um, that's one example we eliminated busy work requirements for facilities that example I just gave as another example of kind of just busy work expecting the tra transporter to keep those records of you know, going out every seven days and pulling tires from a business. And then also just kind of remove requirements that again, were not enforceable. That is another example of, of that something that's not really enforceable. We really don't know where these transporters uh, preposition these trailers um, and that the likelihood that they're keeping these records and pro providing these records to the scrap tire generating business are just slim to none. So these are just kind of examples of some of the some of the uh, improvements we made. Next slide. So I just want to touch on the rule layout. Next slide. So presently we have 20 rules in chapter 27 that cover the scrap tire management universe. Next slide. Thank you. So in the proposed changes, we essentially wanted to number the rules in a format that would make it easy to understand where to find information. So what we what we did is in series zero through 99, we dedicated this, this series to general obligations that almost all parts of the scrap tire management infrastructure are subject to. Next slide. So from zero through 99, it kind of conforms to the multi to the other multi-program rule packages. If it covers applicability, you know, has a definition, a dedicated definition section, which is always O2, uh, incorporation section, general obligations, and then as I mentioned before, any rules that really are applicable to most of the scrap tire management universe. Next slide. And then for the actual universe or, or infrastructure, for each piece, each piece was given its own series, um, des designed so that the regulated entity could find all of their requirements in one location or in a, or in a number series. And then they no longer have to pick through the rules to see what they are subject to. So what you see here is that the 100 series is for registered transporters, 200 series is the collection facilities, the 300 series is storage facilities, recovery is 400, and so on and so on, as you see on the slide. And then even within that series, we try to make the particular rule itself have the same numbering. So if it's operational requirements, those are always going to end in 10. Record keeping and reporting going to end in 15. Closure is going to end in 25. As you probably know, like presently, you know, if you look at OAC Rule 3745-2765, that is the operational rule for scrap tire collection, storage, and recovery facilities. It's 13 pages long. And if you're a collection facility, probably only three pages of that operational rule are, are relevant to you. So um, really, really try to just 
make it easier to navigate the rules and let someone stay within a series to understand what all their obligations are. Next slide. So as you be, as you look at these rules when they go out interested party, uh, just one at least one resource that we have available uh, to you is an Excel workbook. It essentially says where did the requirement go? So what it's going to do is it's going to take the existing rule that you are very familiar with, and then for each requirement in that rule, say hey, this is where it moved to 580. And if the requirement didn't move, it was deleted. It will specify such. So hopefully this will be a good resource for you as you navigate these exciting rules. We're also talking about having a focused Microsoft Teams meeting during the interested party comment period. So you can ask questions or we can at least explain um, some of the frustra uh, frustrations or issues you're encountering as you're trying to review the rules. Next slide. And I just wanna briefly touch on some substantive changes that we made to the rules that I think really are gonna impact our inspectors and just how we do business. So I'm excited to kind of share some of these with you. Next slide. So we have some general changes. I think the most important one is how the change that we've made for the scrap tire generating businesses. As I mentioned earlier, we're talking about something like 5,000 to 8,000 businesses that we regulate under 2760, which is that rule that addresses the, the um, businesses that are excluded so businesses and operations that are excluded from having to become licensed um, scrap tire facilities. Well, a big portion of 2760 is made up of the fire code. We have extensive requirements in 2760 for how they have to store their tires. Guess what? It's all gone. So we removed the scrap tire storage requirements. And one reason, there are a couple of reasons we did that. First one is that we, we from the survey efforts and um, just talking with our inspectors, we, we realized that and this is health department and of course EPA inspectors. We realized that in some instances they were not um, the decisions they were making as they went out to these to these businesses were not being supported by the local fire departments, and some of that was based on the resources they had available or just their interpretation of the fire code. So. We decided, you know, we're probably just going to leave the fire code for these scrap tire generating businesses, not not the licensed facilities that we have control over from the from the very beginning. But just these scrap tire generating businesses, we're going to just kind of leave that responsibility of how they store their tires to the to the locals. The other thing is that when you're talking about 5,000, 8,000 businesses, the, the, the EPA or demo was not really EP, DIMWIM, as well as help from our health department inspectors, we really just don't have the manpower to properly regulate these businesses if we're talking about something like um, checking to make sure that they're adhering to fire code. Um, and other states that actually inspect these businesses on a regular basis, they have way more staff than we have available here, or we've, you know, in Ohio. So that was another reason that we just decided to turn that back over to, to the fire departments. We're still going to require the scrap tire generating businesses to perform mosquito control. But then there's a new requirement that came that was a recommendation from the scrap tire summit and form, and that was to have these scrap tire generating businesses secure their tires on site. The fact that uh, you may be familiar with the term tire jockeys, which are guys that kind of go around and pick through the tires and um, take the ones that they can sell to the secondary market, the fact that tire jockeys um, as well as sometimes people who are looking for a way to make a quick buck, like maybe if they have a drug problem, often go onto these onto these properties and just take tires. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. Um, and then when they when they determine they can't sell them to the used tire market, they sometimes you know abandon them. This was identified as one of the primary reasons why we're still having to clean up tires. And so what we're going to essentially what we're proposing is for them to actually begin to secure these tires on, on their property. Next slide. Another change is that we're going to significantly reduce the size of the scrap tire fire remediation rule. This is a rule we've had in place for a very long time, and I actually don't know if it's utilized as much as it, sh it doesn't 
seen it be utilized as much as it should be, but it is a very essential rule. Um, what it presently does is, though, it creates two different scenarios in terms of how you have to remediate a site, depending on the passenger tire equivalents that are, are pres that are involved in the fire. So if it's 10,000 passenger tires equivalents or less, uh, then you do one set of remediation, and then if you have more than that amount of passenger tire equivalents involved in the fire, you have to do another set. What we decided to do is, you know what, we're not going to distinguish between the number of tires that are part of the fire. We're just going to have them clean up to visual standards. And if further remediation needs to take place, we will do that on the director's um, findings and orders. Another significant um, general change is that we are increasing the passenger tire equivalent from 20 pounds to 25 pounds. So, tip, so passenger tire equivalent is, is a definitely a way to kind of convert between different types of ways of measuring uh, tire piles. But really what the PTE is trying to kind of address is what the, the weight of a passenger tire or a light duty truck tire once it is no longer, uh, once it comes off the vehicle. And so what we're just doing by increasing the passenger tire equivalent from 20 pounds to 25 pounds is updating the value to reflect changes in consumer buying practices. You know, over the last 10 years, consumers have been buying larger cars like SUVs, you know, crossovers, light duty trucks, and these vehicles have larger tires. So based on research performed by the Tire Industry Association, where they actually went out to recovery facilities and weighed, you know, recovery facilities throughout the entire US and weighed the tires as they were going over their conveyors, um, they were able to kind of come up with an average value of 25 pounds for, for the typical tire that they were receiving. And then we reached out to our recovery facilities in Ohio to kind of verify that if they felt like this was a reasonable value. Most of them said yes, and in fact, it might even be on the, on the low end, depending on where you're getting your tires from. You know, they are seeing uh, tires as, as heavy as 30 pounds. So we thought 25 pounds is a good place to start. Uh, based on the fact there were studies to kind of support it. Next slide. So let's just kind of talk about some substantive changes to, for transporters. So you, what you're going to see when you review the rules is that we've increased the number of exclusions by four, but really there's only one new exclusion. And that exclusion is a four higher motor carrier. This exclusion was crafted to address the knowledge that Ohio EP obtained in the process of updating the rules from its inspectors. Essentially, some of the scrap tire recovery facilities and registered scrap tire transporters sell semi-trailers of good use tires to companies in other states and to other countries. These trailers are hauled by four high motor carriers that are regulated under PUCL. So after obtaining this information, we decided to include this exclusion for a, co a couple of significant reasons. One reason is that scrap tire recovery facilities and scrap tire registered transporters felt like once they sold the scrap tires, it, it was no longer their responsibility to ensure that they are transported to a registered scrap tire transporter out of, out of the state. Another factor is that scrap tires have value, that these, I'm sorry, these scrap tires in particular have value because they were not only purchased but also someone was willing to pay for them to be transported to, out of state or out of country. Therefore, the likelihood that they may be open dumped lessened in our, in our view. The last factor is that presently in rule, we have an exclusion um, from having to become a registered transporter for tires that are um, transported by bar, ship, or rail, but we don't have an exclusion to cover over the road transport. Many of Ohio's registered transporters do not provide this type of service anymore. And so we are dealing with a specialized portion of, of transport of the transport industry, which it seemed reasonable to extend this exclusion. Another change for transporters is that we're going to require them to delineate the different operations and activities on their property. In Ohio, we have some, some uh, transporters that are actually retreaders. They have new and used, they have a used tire shop, and then they also are a transporter. And so uh, when you have all these different activities going on on the same property or adjacent properties, it is, it is hard for our inspectors to figure out, are they meeting their storage limits, storage requirements? Um, it's, it's just hard to kind of 
evaluate every single thing that's going on. And so we're going to have them submit plan view drawings, nothing complex um, that clearly distinguishes the different activities that are taking place on the property so that it will help our inspectors understand whether they're in compliance. One other thing I wanted to share um, off this slide is that we are going to require registered transporters to place decals on their on their um, the trucks that they use to transport tires. Now, this was not a recommendation from the Tire Summit, but it was a solution that was proposed, and we felt like it was a good one. Essentially, having them put this decal on a vehicle will help assist law enforcement ID registered transporters. And this concept of, of requiring decals is commonly used in other states. Next slide. So we have approximately um, about 100 registered transporters, and every year we struggle with retaining our transporters and obtaining new transporters, and we always need new transporters. One of the issues that is impacting whether we, we're able to retain or in, and obtain transporters is the requirement for them to have a standby trust. For some of these transporters, just to actually set up a standby trust, which is just an empty account at a bank, um, is costing them $7,500. And then to maintain that trust could cost them $2,500 per year. So um, because we, or at least at the time we were working on these rules, had not really had to pull financial assurance and place this money into a standby trust, we decided, you know, we need to explore if there's a way that we can remove this requirement. Well, since we started working on rules, we have had a couple instances where we've had to pull the money, but we've been able to actually clean up the issue within a couple of couple of months. And so we feel like we have found a workaround and we're going to remove this requirement from registered transporters that do not operate solid waste facilities. Just transporters that all they do is transport. But so like the liberties of the world and some of the now recovery facilities that are transporters will still have the requirement to have a standby trust. But again, just the regular registered transporter will not have this requirement. Um, we also cleaned up the financial assurance funding mechanisms that they're allowed to utilize um, because while by present rule, they're allowed to utilize all the financial assurance funding mechanisms, really some of them do not work in practice with, with transporters, and so we removed three of them. But of course, they can always request to use them and we'll evaluate that on a case-by-case -case basis. Next, next slide. Just want to quickly wrap this up. So presently in rule, we actually have exclusions that don't require a transfer facility or a construction and demolition debris landfill to become a licensed scrap tire collection or storage facility. But what the rule presently does and do is put a limit on the amount of ties that they're allowed to have on the site. So the proposed rule changes will actually uh, set a limit on the amount of tires they're allowed to have on site, and that will match what is allowed for a collection facility, which is 5,000 cubic feet. They also will have to store the tires in uh, portable containers. And then we're extending this exclusion to the newly created um, construction demolition debris processing facilities. Next slide. We're making um, one, one significant change to the recovery facilities. So presently, daily design input capacity is really calculated based on the processing equipment at the site, which can be can turn out to be a pretty complex calculation. Well, this isn't really how DIMWIM operates. You know, DIMWIM op operates off AMPWARS. And so what we've done is pro uh, we're proposing a new definition for daily design input capacity to mean the maximum weight of scrap tires that can be accepted at a scrap tire recovery facility per day. So essentially, Daily design input capacity based on the maximum amount of tires they expect to receive over their scale or through their gate. Next slide. We're also kind of repurposing or redesigning the mobile scrap tire recovery facility. When you look at the present rules, the mobile recovery facility just kind of seems to be the existing stationary recovery facility that now kind of moves around. And that, well, we first of all don't have any mobile recovery facilities. But also that's not kind of when we're getting inquiries from the public on becoming one, that's not really how they plan to operate in the future. So we've kind of repurposed the mobile scrap tire recovery facility to really be 
a recovery facility that shows up on a property that has that has tires already there on the site and they are going to shred the tires and remove them or shred them and to a product that that can be utilized on the site. So as a result, you're going to really see these rules revamped. Next slide. OK, a couple other quick this is my last slide here. So as I mentioned earlier, we have two class, two types of mono cell facilities. We have contiguous and non contiguous. And so what we decided was based on really the difference between the two that, you know, a, a non contiguous mono cell facility. Um, is not contiguous to the cells, phases and or units of a sanitary or industrial and manufacturing waste landfill. Uh, such that it is like physically separated from other cells and it has separate environmental control systems such as, you know, leachate collection and surface water management, et cetera. And so what we've decided is, you know, really, we're just going to remove this non-contiguous scrap tire monocell facility and just make it a scrap tire monofill facility. So we now have one category of scrap tire monocell facilities, and that is if it's contiguous, if it's in the footprint of an existing landfill, it is a scrap tire monocell, and then anything else is going to be a scrap tire uh, monofill facility. We've also updated the regulations for the scrap tire monofill facility to reflect the latest changes to the solid waste and industrial and manufacturing waste landfill rules. So again, as you if you've looked at those real packages, you'll see that there's been you know changes to ASTMs, landfill design, you know, operational requirements. And then we're also we've also added in a few fire prevention um, requirements in the scrap tire monofill facility rules. So that's the end of the substantive changes. Again, we I really encourage you to uh, review the rules. I'm hoping make all interested party next week. I so want to hear from you. I'm so pumped. I'm so excited. It's been a long five years, and um, I just really hope that you read the rules and can provide amazing feedback to us. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Um, and and I I echo that. Um, you know the need for folks to um, be a part of that that rule review process and and to uh, provide that feedback and input. It's it's really important. So um, a lot of really great information there in your slide deck and and um, we'll be sure to get that out to um, the approved health departments, um, get that information shared. So um, if anyone does have any questions or comments uh, for Shannon, um, please feel free to raise your hand or put those in the chat um, and we'll get those uh, squared away. Um, if not, we will move on to our next agenda item and Kelly Smith will provide um, some information on financial assurance case studies. Uh, but thank you, Shannon, for um, that presentation. Oh yeah, my pleasure. And Kelly, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Nikki. Hi, everybody. I'm Kelly Smith, and um, I am I am the financial assurance unit in our enforcement financial assurance and scrap tire section. Um, I oversee financial assurance for all the the landfills, scrap tire transporters, and facilities, uh, construction, demolition debris landfills, composting, and what have I forgotten? Uh, transfer facilities. There we go. So I'm just going to do a quick overview and some some case studies highlighting some interesting um, some of my more interesting facilities that I've encountered while I've been reviewing financial assurance. And um, I've been doing this for about three years now. So um, let me know along the way if you have any questions and I'm going to shut my camera off here and see if I can share my screen. So Jeff, can you let me know, is, is my screen there? It's up now. Okay. We just switched to your desktop. Well, here we go, we're back. All right. So 
There's there's eight types of financial assurance. Um, some of them are are variations of the same theme. So Shannon had mentioned the the standby trust. Um, other other facilities use it, not just the scrap tire transporters, but so there's the two different types of trusts. Um, there's two different types of bonds that can be used for financial assurance. Uh, there's a letter of credit, insurance, the financial test and corporate guarantee, and also the local government financial test. And the financial assurance rules are, are scattered in different places throughout the rules. Um, in Chapter 27, there, there are the rules for the different landfills. Um, in 400 is the C&D landfill financial assurance rules. And then in Chapter 503, um, where eventually I believe all of the financial assurance rules will be housed. Right now, 503 only covers the transfer facilities and um, the composting facilities. So here's some of the trivia and some of the, the um, facilities I wanted to highlight. So, and some of you can just guess this in your head, but if you know the landfill that has the highest cost estimate for financial assurance for closure and post-closure care. Yeah. And that would be Swaco's Franklin County Sanitary Landfill. So they have 46.7 million for financial assurance for their cost estimate, and that's for closure and post-closure care. But that is not the most financial assurance. So Swaco actually uses the, the funded trust as their mechanism and they used the option for a pay-in period. So as of June 30th, they had $30.9 million in their funded trust. So this, when I, they, we, I get a quarterly statement showing the amount in their trust, and it's always so mind-boggling for me to wrap my head around the fact that they have $30 million in cash sitting in an account set aside for to close the landfill and provide post-closure care. So I rely heavily on the districts, um, both the inspectors and the engineers to provide a cost evaluations of the cost estimates. So I know if the financial assurance is adequate. So it, it's important to differentiate between the cost estimate and the financial assurance. So Swaco has $30 million in financial assurance, but the landfill with the most financial assurance is Rumkey's Sanitary Landfill in Hamilton County. And that landfill actually has $44 million in financial assurance. They, Rumkey uses two separate bonds, one for closure and one for post-closure care. Um, Rumkey uses bonds for all of its facilities, transfer facilities and landfills. There is a landfill in the state of Ohio that has $10 million set aside just for corrective measures. And that would be countywide's landfill in Stark County. That countywide landfill is operated and owned by Republic Services. And what's interesting about this is the corrective measures, the $10 million, is set up with a bond. Now, Republic, for almost all of its other facilities, provides financial assurance using insurance. Now, um, insurance is is probably one of the most difficult to manage as far as financial assurance mechanisms. And in the case of Republic, um, they use something called captive insurance. So there's captive insurance and there's mutual insurance or mutual insurance company. And the, the, the difference between the two is ownership. So a captive insurer is an insurance company that's wholly owned and controlled by its insureds. And in this case, Republic, the owner and operator of these landfill facilities and transfer facilities, also owns the insurance company. And so they are essentially self-insuring and they, this separate arm of Republic, the landfill operations, solid waste operations has a separate arm that's an insurance company and they provide the insurance and financial assurance for their solid waste facilities. So, and the difference with that and, and a mutual insurance company like where you and I would get our auto insurance is we technically own those types of insurance companies by being the policy holders and paying for the policy. 
So I want to kind of segue with the um, staying on the topic of insurance for and do a, a case study on a C&D landfill. So for in, in my review, the, the least desirable financial assurance mechanism is the insurance and the problems. I think the biggest problem being that insurance, just like your auto insurance, typically renews on an annual basis. And we rely on the facilities to submit that updated certificate of insurance um, just as a matter of course, kind of like they would, you know, fill out their annual license application. We would expect them to submit their annual update for insurance. So in the case of Penn, Ohio, um, they were having some compliance issues. So I was following up on the financial assurance and they actually have their insurance through Great American Insurance Group, which is a mutual insurance company. It's not a self-insured. Um, so, you know, I made several calls to Great American. They, uh, Penn Ohio was also using a broker and I couldn't get a response from the broker. I reached out to several folks at Penn Ohio and I just couldn't get this updated certificate. So, Often in my um, reviews, I use Google and I have to do a lot of, uh, you know, I search the web a lot to see, to find contacts. So I went to the Great American Insurance Group website and they list, there's four vice presidents for um, environmental insurance. And I emailed all of them and I said, look, we have this six million dollar policy and I cannot find out if it's current. Will someone please contact me? So we ended up finding out that um, that Penn Ohio had not renewed its certificate and was without financial assurance for almost eight months. So um, ultimately Penn Ohio got a bond and they're now in compliance. So I also wanted to mention there's uh, the major difference or some differences between um, solid waste landfills and C and D landfills as far as the financial assurance goes. And the biggest one here is is the oversight. So Ohio EPA does the oversight for the solid waste landfills, but our approved health departments provide the oversight of the financial assurance for C and D facilities. So. Um, Oftentimes, I, most times, I have no idea for the C&D landfills that are in the approved health districts um, what type of mechanisms are being used or what their financial assurance is. So, and I, and I just want to mention that if any of the health districts ever have questions or want to talk about the financial assurance um, for the C&D facilities in their district, I, I am happy to discuss that. The other thing that is the big difference is um, CND facilities. The rule says that they don't have they have to have a minimum of thirteen thousand dollars per acre for um, closure, and the um, the solid waste landfills their closure as co closure cost estimate is provided third party and. They um, typically use, we have some guidance documents, guidance document number 675 that breaks down the different, um, the cost requirements for the cost estimate. So another type of landfill um, is the industrial manufacturing waste landfills. And there is one particular mechanism that is only used by this type of landfill. They can use the bond or the trust or the insurance, but something that the, the industrial manufacturing waste landfills use that other facilities don't is the financial test and the corporate guarantee. So to pass the financial test, they have to show, um, they have to have at least $10 million in assets, and then they have to show that they meet these certain ratios of um, assets to liabilities. Um, the thing that's interesting about this and the case study I want to present here is Materian in Ottawa County. They have an industrial waste landfill. They use the financial test. The thing that makes it interesting is they have requested trade secret protection for their financial test. Um, they're a privately held company and they have to provide this information about their audited financial statements. And if um, one of their competitors were to see their audited financial statements, it, it could cause 
harm to the company's balance sheets. So we're always very careful when we receive um, their annual financial test. Another case study I wanted to present was the, the Hollow Rock um, First Energy, now known as Energy Harbor. This is another IMW landfill that um, takes residual waste. It's a, a, a utility type company. So they also have um, a, a very changing financial assurance picture over time. So from January 2008 to March of 2017, they also used the financial test and the corporate guarantee. In April 2017, they came to Dimwim and they said, we want to change to a bond and a standby trust. So they put up a $12 million bond for closure and post-closure care, and they set up a standby trust. So in September of that same year, in 2017, they came to us and said, we want to convert that bond to cash and we want to fund a trust. So they um, took, they, we terminated the bond, they deposited $12.3 million into a funded trust. So cash, $12 million for closure and post-closure care. Right after they did that, they filed for bankruptcy. So of course, you know, we have speculated that it was a convenient place to sort of park $12 million while they were going through these bankruptcy proceedings. Well, then in October of 2021, Energy Harbor came to us and said, we want the cash back. Here is a bond and we will maintain the standby trust. And so we had to make the recommendation to our director that that $12 million be returned to the facility because they have provided acceptable alternate financial assurance in the form of the bond. I'm glad that Shannon had a chance to tell everybody about the scrap tire transporters. Um, they are the most challenging of our financial assurance um, just because they also often need assistance to get the standby trust because they typically use a performance bond with the standby trust. Um, Shannon also mentioned with these new rules, and again, insurance is, is the highlight here. Scrap tire transporters um, are not a good fit for insurance because often their policies have pollution exclusions. So if a scrap tire transporter used an insurance policy, the exclusion might say, Ohio EPA can't use this to clean up tires unless they're on the transporter's property and in a truck and um, you know, are owned by the transporter. So typically when we do scrap tire cleanups, these tires are abandoned in some farm field. And so the, the insurance policy would be difficult for us to draw on to do a cleanup. Shannon also mentioned that we're trying to do away with the standby trust. And the reason for that is a lot of times because these are just empty accounts waiting if we have to draw the money for the money to be deposited, the trusts are often closed after several years because the, the electronic systems at banks like lose track of them. There's no money in them. The smaller community banks just they don't keep track of them. And so when I came on board, there were a number of these trusts that no longer existed. So the transporters had to go out and, and open the new trust. So we're hopeful that with the new rules um, that the standby trust will no longer be a requirement for the transporters. Um, and, and they are also the most often drawn upon financial assurance. I think Shannon stole my thunder on this one. The largest scrap tire company in Ohio is Liberty Tire Services of Ohio. Um, they're unique because um, they also use the financial test and the corporate guarantee. They have over a million dollars in financial assurance for um, two class one recovery facilities, closure and post-closure care, their monofill, and then they have a registered scrap tire transporter. Um, they actually, their corporate parent of Liberty Tire Services of Ohio is two tiers above, um, and it's the Liberty Tire Recycling Hold Co., and it's a Delaware corporation. Um, prior to using the uh, financial test, Liberty used letters of credit for each separate um, aspect of their business. Um, 
they are Ohio EPA's main contractor for no fault scrap tire cleanups, and they have the most registration certificates of any of the transporters at 52. So they use 50 of them in their vehicles, and then they have two of them at their, um, their processing facilities. I wanted to touch on transfer facilities because I know a lot of the health districts um, have transfer facilities in their county. They're actually the easiest to oversee the financial assurance for. Typically, they only have to increase every year for inflation. So if they use a bond, you know, they will increase have a bond rider to increase the amount. Um, but they're they're fairly easy to, to keep squared away. Um, one interesting case study I had. Now that the transfer facility financial assurance rules are in 503, there's a, a new requirement that they establish a restricted fund to set aside the funds to do closure of the transfer facility. The thing is, when the 503 rules were written, they, we anticipated that the landfills would eventually be um, have their financial assurance in 503. So. It required the establishment of this restricted fund, but the, one of the requirements was you had to estimate the, the future life of the facility. So this wasn't really applicable to transfer facilities. This was more of a landfill requirement. So when I worked with the auditor at Portage County and we talked about this restricted fund and it's like a funded trust and there's a pay-in period. So Portage County wanted to fund their initial funding was for a thousand dollars and even though their cost estimate was fifty nine thousand and I'm like uh no that's not going to work you need to fund the whole amount of the transfer facility so after working with them uh, um they went ahead and set up a restricted fund with the entire amount the Delaware County transfer facility is another interesting case study um they their cost estimates only $19,000 and change and the Delaware County Commissioners had established a funded trust. So their bank was getting ready to charge them $2,500 a year to maintain this $19,000 in their trust. Well, the transfer facility was um, operated by Rumkey and Delaware County had just recently contracted um, with Rumkey to operate. So what we ended up doing was as part of um, the commissioner's contract with Rumkey, they had Rumkey provide the financial assurance. So the commissioners were able to close their trust and not have to maintain the financial assurance anymore because Rumkey as the operator was, was providing it. I did want to touch on composting facilities also because I, I think the health districts have those. Um, they're somewhat problematic for financial assurance purposes because um, their cost estimates were established um, some time ago. Um, they don't increase for inflation. So it's, you know, they are just maintaining the instrument that was established when they first established the composting facility. And a lot of them with an older registration, you know, the, Conditions at the facilities may have changed. So, you know, this is something that um, I would like to look into updating and, you know, get more current registration information for the composting facilities so we can make sure the financial assurance is adequate. The highest amount of financial assurance for a composting facility is Earthenwood Products, um, which is a Kurtz Brothers site in Stark County. And that's also the newest um, class two composting facility. So again, updated registration, um, more realistic uh, cost estimate. So $118,000 and the Kurtz brothers uses a bond and a standby trust. So there, um, the second kind of trivia about composting is there's a particular composting operation that typically seeks an exemption from financial assurance. and um, people will be surprised to know that those are correctional facilities. So um, the London Correctional Facility, their cost estimates $131,250, but they don't provide any financial assurance. They have director's orders that exempt them from the requirement. 
um, because they're a, a state agency. So they have the backing of the state of Ohio to provide their financial assurance. So um, also many colleges and universities have robust composting programs. Uh, they were drastically reduced during the pandemic. Um, most of them, they're exempt because their cost estimate is under $5,500. Um, some of the larger universities actually can use the local government financial test to demonstrate that they can um, provide financial assurance to close the composting facility if needed. So those are some of the interesting and unique um, facilities, financial assurance that I've encountered in my time doing the oversight for for the facilities. And if you have any questions, um, my contact information is on the slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, if anyone does have any questions, uh, please feel free to raise your hand or put those questions in the chat. Um, again, a lot of great information um, in the slide deck, and we'll be sure to get that out to folks after the meeting is over. Um, we are running short on time, so um, Jeff, I'm going to turn it over um, to the next agenda item, which is um, our open discussion and other business. Um, we do have the health department newsletter to talk about um, future meetings, whether we want to plan another hybrid meeting for October and then presenters for the October meeting. Um, Jeff, did you or Leanne want to talk about the, the newsletter? Yeah, so just really quick, we are planning on having a newsletter hopefully out before the October Health Department Advisory Panel meeting. So we're getting content. It'll probably be very heavily focused on CDD because that's one of the big uh, things we're looking at now. But if there's any topics that uh, members to address or think we should address, Feel free to forward those along to us. Um, if you have interesting topics or something you want to highlight locally too, uh, we're always looking into those sort of stories we can share with a, a larger group as well. But uh, once that's ready, we'll send out a draft for the members to review, and then we'll get that out to the general approved health department. So um, a, another resource for sharing information and uh, ideas with other health departments. Great, great. Um, so we'll look forward to that. Um, our next meeting is October 27th at 10 a.m. Um, how about if we plan for it to be in person, but um, kind of evaluate as we get closer to the date of, of having that um, hybrid option? Um, if any other panel members would like to chime in on that, um, please do so. Or if you would just prefer that it be a, a hybrid um, that we plan on in October, I think that would be fine too. This is Craig with the Erie County Health Department. I just, I don't like the idea of completely closing the hybrid idea. Um, I would prefer it be in person and everything, but I know even with our tight schedule up here, I mean, I get, you know, it's almost like a five hour turnaround drive for us from Erie County to come to a meeting that might be just a couple hours long. Yeah, completely understood. This is Larry Schaefer. Yeah, I, I, I think. Larry. I think I prefer the hybrid as well. It, it, it seems to work out good for everybody. All right, that sounds good. Um, we we have uh, somebody else chiming in in the chat as well. So um, let's keep it a hybrid uh, for the 27th of October. And if anyone is able to join in person, um, that would be wonderful. If not, um, we will have the teams uh, set up again. Um, I thought that this worked out really well also. Um, and then if you do have any suggestions for presenters um, for the October meeting, um, please send those our way. Um, 
Jeff, I'm not sure if you put your email address in the chat, but um, everyone on the panel should have that um, anyway. And um, just let us know. Uh, and with that, um, we are at 12 o'clock. So can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? This is Jeff Ritchie. I'd make the motion. I think I heard Jeff Ritchie. Yep. Make the motion. Mike, did you second that? Yes, absolutely. I yes, second that. Absolutely. Okay, great. All right, well then we are adjourned for our July meeting. Um, thank you everyone um, for your presentations today and, and um, for the great information. And we will see everyone in October. And again, welcome to the panel, Carrie. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it. All right, have a good one, everyone.